newborn baby walking out of the uh, delivery room. It takes time to learn, and you have to learn to talk. You know, babies begin to jabber and do all this stuff, but they don't learn words or communicating without somebody there to teach them and help them learn those kind of things, right? Or you have to learn how to ride a bike, or you have to learn how to read and write, or you have to learn to look both ways before you cross the street, or how to cook, how to make a bed, how to drive. I mean, when you think about it, all the things that we have to learn in life is kind of staggering, right? I mean, it's just staggering. Well, in our scripture this morning, Paul is talking about a learned skill that takes, it's a learned skill that many people spend a lifetime trying to learn, but few people ever really master. And that skill Paul is talking about, that skill so many of us struggle with, is contentment. Being content. And just like so many essentials in life, like walking and talking, those things, being content is a learned way to live. It's a learned essential. It's a learned skill. Now, let's talk for a second about what it means to be content. You know, if you go look in the dictionary and all that stuff, and if you read the definition of uh, being content, it's going to give you a, a definition that sounds just like the worldly idea of what it means to be happy. Or if you go around and talk to most people in the street what it means to be content, they're going to tell you, you know, oh, it's all about being happy and all this stuff. But you see, for a Christian, for a Christian, it's so much more, right? For a Christ follower, I mean, there's no doubt there's a degree of happiness in it, but it's not based on what's going on around us. It's so much more sustainable. It's not so fragile as happiness, right? Isn't happiness fragile? How many times have you ever woke up and you're all happy and ready to roll and you're going along and about an hour or so into your day, you're in such a bad mood, you could just, you know, bite nails in half. Right? Happiness is fragile. It's like little thin china. But contentment is more than that. Now, let me say this. Contentment isn't walking around with that smile on your face, pretending everything's wonderful when it isn't. You know, but there's an old hymn that churches sing, and I've kind of I've only got a couple songs that I've kind of got a red flag on that I don't like to sing in church. And it's, the song that I'm talking about is, um, It Is Well With My Soul. Now, the reason I song drives me crazy is, I've been in churches where we sang that song and we sang it so slow, I weren't sure if we were in a catatonic state or if we'd all fallen asleep or something, you know? It was so, but, but I do love what it says. The basic premise of the song says that no matter what storm is raging around us, it's well with our souls. Right? You see, contentment isn't about what we can see all around us, grab a hold of, or anything like that. Contentment is a matter of the soul. It's what's going on in here. See, Paul uses the word content. And I think another word that could really describe what Paul's talking about is satisfaction. And it's my opinion that in this world, one of the major things that people are lacking in life is a sense of satisfaction, you know, of the soul. You know, there's no satisfaction on the inside of them. And I think part of understanding contentment is that recognizing that true contentment and satisfaction can only come from God. The only way you're going to be content is when you learn it from God. And like I said, we have to learn to be content. It isn't natural. And just like any kind of learning, I mean, you have to be intentional about it. You have to make an effort to find it. You have to be willing to work for it. So how do we learn the skill of being content? So now, the first thing I think, and listen to me on this, if you want to be content, you have to learn to listen to your soul and not your circumstances. If you want to be content, you have to learn to listen to your soul and not your circumstances. Let me explain what I mean. You know, when I'm feeling this sense of discontent in my life, this unsatisfaction in my life, you know, what's the first thing I try to do? I try to change something in my circumstances, you know? 
or when I feel that sense of discontentment, I start looking around, you know, for what I should be doing or what I'm not doing or all this other stuff. And I think, you know, I look around and I try to figure out what I need to change to make me feel content. But real contentment requires something more, something deeper. It goes beyond our circumstances. And you have to learn to listen to your soul. Let me read you a couple of verses. It's Psalm 42, 1 and 2, and it's from a translation called The Voice, okay? And it says, My soul is dry and thirsts for you, true God. As a deer thirsts for water, I long for the true God who lives. When can I stand before him and feel his comfort? You know, our souls thirst for God and his comfort, just like our bodies thirst for water. You know, I've found in my life that when I get this real feeling of discontent, when there's a real feeling of not being satisfied, it isn't because of what's going on or not what's going on or anything like that. When I'm struggling with discontent, the first place I need to look is my relationship with the Lord. Right? Am I setting God on the back burner of my life? Or have I neglected my relationship with Him? Am I praying? Am I spending time with Him? Am I spending time in the Word? Am I taking some quiet time just to listen? You know, our soul thirsts for God just like our body thirsts for water. And that means if we don't have that satisfying relationship with God, then it doesn't matter what's going on around us. You know, we're not going to have the relief we're looking for. We're not going to have that contentment. So let me ask you right now, in your life, are you content? Is there that feeling of satisfaction? Well, if not, are you trying to change stuff in your life? You know, are there circumstances you can want to change that you think is going to help your schedule, your job, some earthly relationship? Let me read you a verse from what Jesus had to say. In John 4.10, he says, But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Folks, real contentment. I'm talking real contentment that gives you that feeling of satisfaction no matter what is going on starts with a strong, close relationship with God. And when we're feeling dry, we need to check and see if we're doing the things that'll give that living water to our souls, that'll quench that thirst in our souls, that'll help us find that contentment we're all so desperately seeking. Okay? So if you're not feeling content, my suggestion is the first thing to do is listen right here to your soul. Now, I think another way to learn to be content, and this one's like 180 degrees, you know, different than what I'm just talking about, but I think it's important. If you want to learn to be content, you have got to quit comparing yourself to others. I've been in the ministry 30 years, and I've talked to a lot of people about their spiritual lives. And if I had a dollar for every person who says, oh, gosh, I just want to be so much, my mom was this spiritual war, or, you know, this person, oh, I want to be more like them, or I want to be more like this. You know, folks, we have got to quit comparing ourselves to others. If you really want to be content, you can't compare yourself to your friends or your family or coworkers or anyone else. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians. It says, We dare not classify or compare ourselves, for it is not wise. I mean, that's a pretty sharp statement at first. We dare not. I mean, the reality is, all of us growing up were taught to live in this comparison world, okay? 
right? When we're young and kids at home, it's about who gets the biggest dessert, who got the biggest slice of pizza. Then when we get older, it's about who has the nicest bike, or you know, all this kind of stuff. And then or in high school, who has the coolest car, or who has the best looking girlfriend? I always won that one, but anyway. Um, and then when we grow up, you know, who's got the best job? Who's got the best income? Who's got a boat sitting in the parking lot or in their driveway or a pool? You know, we do all this stuff. But remember, God's warned us against it. And why does he warn us against it? Because comparing ourselves to others will crush the contentment in your life like a bug. You know, it causes so much stress. You know, when we look around and think, oh, I'm just not as good as that person, or that person seems like they just have it all together, or they've got it so much more together than me, and it's like blah, 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 blah. You know, to always compare ourselves to others is just poison for the soul. It's poison for contentment. I mean, you know, God wants us to have that contentment in life, and it's silly to think, let me tell you the truth. It's just silly to think that everybody else has got it all together so much more than you or all this stuff. Take a little comfort in this. Most people you see are just as much a hot mess as you are, right? That's the truth. You know, most people are just a hot mess, bunch is a hot mess. I mean, the, probably if you knew, they're comparing themselves to you thinking you've got it all together, right? But I've often wondered if we should have renamed this church the church of the hot mess, because most of us are just a bunch of hot messes that are just hanging on to Jesus for dear life. Hey, right here, the number one guy. But you know, when you compare yourself to others, and when you wish you were like everybody else, you're denying that uniqueness of the handiwork of God for your life. God made you unique. God made you you. God made you who he wanted you to be, right? I mean, Scripture says you are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. You know, Nancy and I, we love art. And anytime we go on vacation, we find a museum of art. You know, my kids make fun of us, like, oh, vacation, you went to the art museum. How was that, Dad? Pretty exciting, which we like it. But, you know... We love to go to museums of fine art. And the thing is, when we go in there, we go and there's just so many paintings. And they're all different. But they're all beautiful. They're all hand, you know, made by this artist. And you know, you can see a touch of the soul in each one of these paintings. They're just beautiful. And I'm glad each painting is different. Can you imagine how boring it'd be if you walked into like a big art museum like the Museum of Fine Art in Washington, D.C., and you had five floors of the exact same painting, each one, I mean, you know, it'd be like, look at two paintings, and you're done with that. Look, folks, you have been made by the hand of God, and he made you unique, right? Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us. You know, don't deny the hand of God that formed you to be who you are. Don't deny the beautiful piece of art you are. Don't deny the fact that you were made by God himself right like you are. Don't compare yourself to everyone else. It will steal your contentment. And last thing I want to talk about, I think contentment, I don't think, I know, contentment happens when you learn in life that Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. You know, when I think about Paul and all he went through, you know, all through his life, I mean, that dude was shipwrecked, snake bit, beaten to a pulp more than once. Um, I don't know what else happened to the guy. He ended up getting beheaded in Rome. I don't think anybody's going to say, man, that Paul had an easy life, did he? But yet through it all, he had contentment. And he said he had learned what it was to be content. And then he talked about how he could do all things 
through Jesus Christ who gave him strength. And in a nutshell, I think what Paul was saying is, as long as I have Jesus, I can make it. As long as I have Jesus, I can do anything. As long as I have Jesus, I've got enough. Jesus was enough for Paul. And folks, when we learn that Jesus is enough for us, we can have contentment. You know, I know I struggle with this sometimes. I get hung up with what I'm going on around me. But then I remind myself of some of the stuff we've gone through in life. But just like Paul, when I've got Jesus here, it's enough. It's enough. And I'm just praying that we all know that Jesus is enough. Let me read you a quote I found. It says, until Jesus is enough, nothing else will be. Until Jesus is enough, nothing else will be. That's contentment. Right? That's contentment. And you know, I think that's a big part of what Jesus was talking about on that night before he gave his life for us. He told us to live in remembrance of him. Why? Because he wanted us to know he's enough. He is enough. Come on up, Jason. Or whoever, you wanna to come too? No, you're okay. Yeah, you go ahead, come on up. You can do juice. So, let me tell you, on that night, before he gave his life, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And he goes, he know, look, let me tell you, Jesus knows this world is broken. But we don't have to succumb to it. We don't have to lose our contentment because he was broken for us. And he took the juice and he raised the cup and he gave thanks and he said, this represents my blood which washes away all your sin. Folks, we've got a Savior who loves us and died for us and washed us clean. That's enough. That's enough. So today, as you come forward and you take the bread and you drink the juice, we're going to come back to our seats and take it as a family like we do, but when we do that, just know that no matter what else is going on around you, that you can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives you strength. And he is enough. So come forward as you feel led and experience that love of Jesus. Grand earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all. front of me 
will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. So let go, my soul, and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. So let go, my soul, and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. take, eat, and be thankful. And drink the cup and know you are forgiven. Folks, my prayer is that we all live in remembrance of Jesus. We know he's enough, and we know his contentment. Let's say a prayer. Well, Lord, we love you so much. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all you've done for us, and thank you for being enough. And Lord, I pray, I pray that each and every one of us can know your contentment that our souls won't be thirsty to be filled with the living water. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Will you stand and join us? Just 
is always open. Christ is our all in all, and he's enough. Amen. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness. 